So what in your life has happened that has showed you like how the world doesn't really understand you or ADHD? Um, if you could put that in the, in the comments, that would be really great. Um, I have a few ideas what I feel like the world gets wrong about ADHD. Um, and of course, the first one is that it's a willpower problem when it's really a biologically based condition. Um, Amanda says that they are not forgiving when you forget things. Oh, yes. I think that is a huge problem that they think that that somehow the forgetfulness is on purpose and there's not a kind of kindness or compassion toward you because you forget things. Angie says people think that we are just hyperactive or stupid or lazy. Um, they don't get that we just need a different way to understand concepts. I agree. Um, I like to think of people with ADHD as outside the box thinkers or alternative learners. Um, and I think that that can really help in terms of not only how you see your brain, but how other people see that brain. Um, Tracy says another thing the world gets wrong is just try harder. Yes, they believe it's um, a motivational issue rather than a biological issue. Gail says the world is clueless. <laughs> yes, in some ways I think it is. Um, so I think one of the things that you know the world gets wrong is that this is a biologically based condition. And believe me, if you could do differently or do better, you would. Um, and often you try hard. You're trying all the time to make things better. And so I think that people don't really see how much people with ADHD are trying. Angie, yes, we try so hard and people think we're not trying at all. The inconsistency, yes. So people don't really understand the inconsistency of it. And they think that that's just you know part of your personality rather than you yourself would probably like to have more predictability and consistency and you can't. Um, Gail says the world has zero tolerance for lateness. Yes, the world is not super tolerant for lateness and people tend to feel like when you're late, you're, you know, it's because you don't care about them rather than, you know, you have trouble with time management. I personally have trouble with time management because I think I can always squeeze more into a given amount of time than I can or I underestimate how long something's going to take. And so I think that not understanding lateness and struggling with time management is really hard in today's world. Carolina, assuming kids should act on age like classmates. Right. So what a lot of times the world doesn't understand is that there's an up to three year delay in, in the maturation of the ADHD brain. It's not that the organs are maturing. It's that the connections from the prefrontal cortex where the executive functioning skills are to the rest of the brain are maturing more slowly and they need just they just need more time to make those connections um, and so it's they don't you know people will look at kids with ADHD or kids who are on the spectrum or TUI or um, or LD kids and they'll think well you look the same as your peers why don't you act the same instead of understanding that what's happening inside is not necessarily what you see on the outside uh, Amanda says they need to know we are in neuro a different neurotype. That's right. And just like there's gender diversity and racial diversity and religious diversity and ethnic diversity, there's also neurodiversity. And, and I wish we could think about it that way because everybody has their own little quirks about how their brain works. And, and I think that if, if we had more of a plurality in how we approach um, neuro, um, neurodiversity, it would be less stigmatizing for the people who live with brains that are wired differently. So um, thank you for your comments and please keep sending them. So one thing the world needs to know is that it's not a willpower problem, that it's a biologically based condition that, that has to do with smaller structures of the brain, sometimes the amygdala or the hippocampus, which is the seat of memory. Right here, the right anterior, anterior frontal gyrus. This has part of the executive functioning skills, the corpus callosum, which has to do with integrating details and the, you know, helping the left and right brains work together. So these are structures, among others, that may be smaller in ADHD brains. And, um, and so people don't really understand that it's not something you can necessarily help, that you learn the skills to manage your ADHD over time. Tracy says, speaking fast is something you can control. Stop doing on command. I see. So people think that you could just speak slower if you wanted. And, and that may be true or may not be true. I mean, impulse control is challenging for all of us. 
Gemma says, my son's dad and I are separated and my son has finally been diagnosed with ADHD. He can behave so differently with his dad and can be horrendous for me. I've tried to explain the whole safe place person um, or the Coke bottle effect. Can you clarify this? I'm tired of battling him as well. Yes. So um, Amanda, that, uh, first of all, Angie, I want to just take your question because I want to make sure, you know, Facebook sometimes erases the question. So I'm just copying it to make sure I can get to it. And let me ex answer your question, um, Amanda. So, um, I mean, Gemma, excuse me. So Gemma, um, one of the things that happens, and this is not, this does not have to do with ADHD, but this has to do with um, child development and trauma, is that kids will often act out towards the people that they feel very connected or attached to because they feel safe. You know, one kid, one of my clients said, well, my parents aren't going to divorce me, right? And so you know, my parents can't, you know, kick me out of school, kick me out of the family. And so there's a sense like I have to hold it together so much everywhere else that when I come home, you know, I'm going to act it out because I, I, I feel like I feel safe or I know you're, you're going to be more accepting than other people. And that's very difficult. And so what we want to try to do for kids who struggle this way is to set some parameters around what's okay behavior and what's not okay behavior in advance of the not okay behavior to plan that it's going to occur instead of being surprised every time it does. And what are some consequences that you agree would be fair and ask your kids about this you know because kids often are much stricter in their in what they think are reasonable consequences than what we might come up with so we want to kind of come up with a way for kids not you know what's okay and what's not okay in the family but also to teach kids how to self-soothe I mean when kids with ADHD are dysregulated it's because they don't know what else to do they're showing you with their bodies or their words, how out of control they feel inside. And so we want to come up with a plan around that where we expect that that's going to happen instead of being surprised and one that uh, promotes safety. Thank you, Gemma. That's a great question. Angie asks, how can we deal with people, coaches, teachers, bosses who don't understand or believe what we are going through, tired of hearing, I'm not trying or making excuses? You know, I think one of the best things you can do, Angie, in those situations is education. You know, maybe there's an article or two from Attitude that you can send to them about ADHD. I think a lot of um, bosses, coaches, teachers are just ill-informed or, you know, frankly, ignorant about ADHD and how it, how it works. Or they think you take medication and that will magically make your issues go away. And it doesn't work that way medications for ADHD make you more available to learn those critical executive functioning skills. And everybody has executive functioning strengths and challenges. I've spoken here before about how not so great with emotional control and maybe some time and time management, but the other of my skills are pretty well intact. And for a lot of people with ADHD, it's the reverse. There are a, a couple of few skills that they're really solid on and then a lot that need a lot of support and shoring up. And so we want to try to talk to people about how, you know, what helps you is scaffolding and structure and support and you're working on that. And are you working on that? I assume you are. And and maybe offering them some things that would be supportive towards you that are very specific because a lot of people don't understand and they don't know what to do. Zoe says the assumption that you can be top of the class and have ADHD. Oh, you can't be top of the class and have ADHD. Right. So you can't be smart if you have ADHD, which is just ridiculous because ADHD and um, learning disabilities and uh, autism spectrum disorder level one have nothing, zero to do with intelligence, anxiety, nothing to do with anxiety, with intelligence. So, um, uh, what I think that it's important to say is that, um, you know, you can be smart and still struggle. And then that's one of the really great challenges for 2E kids and adults, which is like you have superior intelligence and lagging skills in other areas. And so there's this constant internal discrepancy and performance discrepancy. Angie said, God, I wish it was that simple. I know it doesn't, it sounds um, like I'm trying to simplify and I'm not. But I do think if you can narrow down one executive functioning skill that you're working on 
you know, at work or with a coach or with a teacher that you can um, decide that that's the thing that you're, you're, you're going to improve immediately or, you know, pay the most attention to. And then they see progress in that one area. It might help spread uh, to other areas. Deborah asks, is anger part of ADHD? Well, um, everybody who who's a human being has anger. It's just that a lot of people with ADHD struggle with emotional control. And that means that, you know, what happens is we have this tidal wave of emotion and bam, suddenly we're just trying to like swim with our head above water. Or some kids have described to me, it's like a volcano bubbling up inside with little spurts that come out here and there. So it's the combination of having these intense emotions um, that aren't particularly regulated well by your executive functioning skills and the lack of impulse control around dealing with those emotions. Uh, Jenny, I wish more people knew about rejection sensitivity. I wish they did too, Jenny. Um, I think rejection sensitivity is such a key part, particularly for women, of having ADHD. And we've done um, an episode on rejection sensitivity last year, and I know we're going to get to it again this year because it's so important. Uh, I think that people don't understand what rejection sensitivity dysphoria is, and they kind of think, you know, you're being a child or you should get over it. And, and, I, and I wish, I, I agree, and I think the best thing is, like, Give them an article. There's lots of great articles in, uh, um, uh, on attitude about rejection sensitivity. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to treat you any better. The other thing is for you actually to hold your own rejection sensitivity gingerly and kindly so that you can try to set up some, some, some boundaries and some ways to soothe yourself or talk to yourself when you're struggling or have some friends who are some regular supports or a coach or a therapist. Adults do that as well, yes. Um, Molly, my husband has ADD diagnosed as an adult. When we found out about rejection sensitivity, our marriage changed immensely. That's fantastic, thank you. Maybe Molly uh, put up a comment about how it changed or what you did that made it change. You're welcome, Gemma. Um, can you offer some insight as to why ADHD often doesn't show up in girls until middle school, but a diagnosis at a younger age could be beneficial considering the effects on their middle school experience? What are earlier signs for ADHD in girls at an elementary school age when hyperactive is not a factor? Yes, I can talk about that. So ADHD shows up often in girls um, in middle school because uh, many girls who struggle with ADHD are inattentive. And we see in boys at a younger age, hyperactive, impulsive. So um, they, it draw, they, 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 they command more attention from teachers or parents or physicians. Um, um, for girls, they're able to sort of, their intelligence is able to cover uh, for their um, lagging executive functioning skills until middle school when they cannot manage all of the, sh the shifting the flexibility that's needed, the organization, the planning, the prioritizing, the working memory, the time management, you know, being able to initiate things on their own and complete them. And so all, all of the executive functioning skills that really come into play in middle and high school just highlight um, some challenges that they've had all along, but they may not have been, no that may not have been noticed. And so when we want to look for signs for, for ADHD in girls at an elementary school age, you know, we want to look for, you know, are they, um, are they dreamy? Are they, um, do they struggle emo with managing big feelings? Um, do they have trouble with timeliness? Um, are, what are their peer relationships like? Um, do they have a lot of anxiety? A lot of times girls in elementary school are referred for anxiety or depression when the real issue is ADHD. There's lots of comments, so I'm going to keep going. Carolina says, my son is in junior high and totally lost on the concept of having a girl who is a friend and a girlfriend. His girlfriend asked a boy out and he thinks they're not friends anymore. Oh, maybe we should do a whole um, session and on middle school social relationships. I think that would be a great thing to do. What happens in middle school is so complicated. And for a lot of kids with ADHD and many kids who are level one on the autism spectrum, they're able to sort of mask some of their social challenges in elementary school 
by mimicking or copying what other people say or sort of camouflaging and blending in. But then when they get to middle school and high school um, or junior high, um, the, 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 the pressures are different. The, the social situations are more nuanced. And so this is exactly the kind of thing that would be so hard for a kid with ADHD. Can I have a friend who's a girl? Can I have a girlfriend? What's the difference? How do things change? Um, it, it, they just don't understand how it works. And partially because that part of them is just a little bit younger, it hasn't quite kicked in, but socially they're in the mix of kids where it's kicked in fully. And so um, what we want to try to do with kids is explain how social situations work. You know, the difference between a best friend and a, a buddy and a, fr and a good friend and an acquaintance or somebody you just say hi to. Um, how you can actually have, be friends with someone and have a girlfriend and they don't cancel each other out. Uh, Gemma, when they bottle up everything from the moment they wake up, such as eat your breakfast, that's a little shake of the bottle, brush your teeth, another shake, put your shoes on, etc. And by the time he has, comes home from school, the lid has got to pop, pop off and everything erupts where you where you suppressed everything all day. Hope that makes sense. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. A lot of kids with ADHD work so hard to hold everything together during the day and they come home and then they just let it go. They can't do it anymore. I had a boy who I worked with who would come home and his mom said that he would get home from school. He was like maybe eight and he would literally roll around the kitchen floor and she would be beside herself. She trying to get dinner ready, trying to feed, you know, feed the cat and manage the other child. Uh, and um, so we decided to institute and he would call this flippy floppy time. So we decided to institute family flippy floppy time. Everyone did not have to roll on the floor. We'd come home and for five minutes, people would do something that would help them arrive. He rolled around, mom sat on the couch and just did a medita little meditation app. The middle school daughter sat on the couch and just played with her phone, listened to music. So all of these things helped. So I'm sh I missed a few more things, but Molly says you grow, you slowly grow out of ADHD as you age. Yes, that was on my list as all uh, as well. Child, it's a childhood issue that will uh, be outgrown. Only five to ten percent of kids who are diagnosed with ADHD actually outgrow it, and um, the research on that is is really interesting because we don't have as robust measures to dot to sort of understand and assess adult ADHD as we do for kids. So it's possible the kids outgrow it. It's possible that they learn the tools they need so they don't really have need, require medication or the same kind of support, or they may have, um, they may have outgrown it. Tracy, how do I convince my daughter she is not broken but needs help to teach her the skills she's just lacking in? So, um, I think that that's, you know, the issue, the, the $24 million question, right? How do we all convince ourselves, adults and kids who live with ADHD, that you're not broken, but you need skills? And the only way we can do that is through explaining how ADHD works. Everybody, all people have executive functioning skills. People with ADHD have more challenges than people who don't, and they need more support. And that's why kids need accommodations at school and they have to, they really benefit from having informed and educated teachers. Hi, Lynn. Angie, no, I mean the talking fast. I wish it was as simple to stop. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's hard to stop when you talk fast. I'm a fast talker, I know. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, where A Coke bottle effect. When you present as calm, keeping emotions and feelings in, and when you return home, you'll explode, just like you've taken off the lid of a shaken Coke bottle. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Okay, great. Oh, lots of comments. Hold on, let me get to them. Angie, meds help a lot, but I can't help interrupting, LOL. I just, I can't do it all. No. So, you know, one of the things that would help is if you could pick the thing that you want to work on. You know, people can really only change one thing at a time. You know, my husband's, my husband is always, you know, asking me to do this side or the other. I'm like, one, one thing. I'll work on that for a month and then we can see how it's going. Okay. Um, Amy, natural maskers and also people expected to be just boys so the girls diagnosed later. That's exactly right. Gemma, I'm sure my son also has ODD. I've heard it can run alongside ADHD. Also, does anyone else struggle with 
their person who has ADHD struggle with them lying. Yes, that's very common. And we can do a session on dealing with defiance and lying again. Um, yes, ODD travels with ADHD, and that has to do with impulse, emotional control, emotional regulation, and poor impulse control. 40% of kids with ADHD have a coexisting diagnosis of ODD. Angie, um, plus we are not just chatty running around the class, LOL, and if we aren't failing, we must not have ADHD. Exactly. That's one of the major misconceptions. Susan, got through high school, uh, school and easily until high school, and then was struggling. Okay. Uh, yes, please. On I think that's on the social anxiety, Carolina, but I'm not sure. Can you let me know? Angie, same. I did well, and then you failed hard. Amanda, I believe that belief systems need to be looked at in order to accept our neurodiversity. We are different and can be a great asset to a team. Absolutely. People who are neurodiverse are naturally outside the box thinkers and creative thinkers. Who wouldn't want those people on a team? Carolina, my son doesn't know how to mask. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but we do need to, you might want to practice some role plays with him on how to respond when certain things are said or how to ask for time. I'm not sure. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Can I have five minutes to think about it? Kids, many kids with ADHD and particularly those who struggle with processing speed need a little more time. Um, Megan Ann, my daughter will be 10 and I'm entering middle school next year. I need it all explained to me. She has ADHD and almost ASD. Well, I'm so glad you're here. That's great. Zoe, my seven, nearly eight-year-old girl gets looked at by girls like she is an alien. Fortunately, she's oblivious. I tell her, just go play with the boys, really dreading senior <laughs> school. Okay, well, a lot will happen between seven and senior school. And um, some, kids, some girls with ADHD, and particularly, actually, um, girls who have um, level one ASD like to play with neurotypical boys. They, if they feel like it's easier for them, they're more understood. Um, Amy, I'm 49 and got diagnosed this year. Congratulations. It was my daughter getting diagnosed that made me realize I was the same. Life makes more sense. That's wonderful. Um, so it's hard to listen when everyone else talks slow. Most YouTube has to be speeded up to be bearable. Right, so you you like things at a particular fast rate, and that's fine. It doesn't, you know, you have a faster processor or than other people. That doesn't mean anything's wrong or better about you. It's just different. Um, okay. Yes, ADHD is in the genetics. Fifty-seven percent or fifty-five percent of adults with ADHD have a child with ADHD. And if you have one child with ADHD, there's a 33% chance you're going to have a second child with ADHD. So that's an important thing to remember and to tell your kids. Um, and if you can figure out how there are some ways in which your brain or your partner's brain uh, and your child's brain are similar, that will help normalize their experience. Uh, Carla asks, how do I overcome I don't care about homework, you care about home? You know, a lot of kids don't care about homework, and there's, you know, different philosophies about homework. Um, I think when kids don't care about homework, it's that their brain is tired. Oh, your son, you care more about homework than me. That's not true. What I think, of course, that's not true. What I think you want to do is to try to set aside a, a, a really um, kind of uh, set amount of time to work on homework, and if it's not finished then, Send it back to the school, and maybe your son needs more accommodations. You don't want to get into these battles with your kids about school. Let their homework be their own. Set homework time aside. Make, break it down into chunks according to how long they can focus. Have short little breaks. And then after a certain amount of time, you know, maybe an hour, when they start to just completely fall apart, depending on their age, or maybe it's 20 minutes, um, you're done. And you send it back to school and let school deal with it. How can you deal with a kid who, that has accommodations but does not take advantage of them? My son doesn't want help from anyone. He's a freshman this year. Well, why don't people want help? That was um, uh, on, my, on my question. You know, People don't want help because they feel embarrassed that something's wrong with them, right? Uh, they will feel like they're ashamed that they're different, um, and, uh, and they think they should be able to do it on their own. So I think it's important to, um, ha, you know, 
focus on their strengths, those islands of competency that make so much difference. And um, so that they can feel like there are areas that they manage on their own and manage not only well, but maybe decently, and some areas where they ask for support, but that the places where they ask for support are not outnumbering um, or at least even with the things that they're, they need help with. Uh, let's see. Um, validate those feelings. It's a hard world out there. Sadly, when you see people, when people see you as different, I agree, Amy. And we want to validate as much as possible rather than reassure because reassurance doesn't teach people the skills they need to soothe themselves and encourage themselves in challenging moments. So we don't want to say it'll be okay or that's not such a big deal. What we want to say is you're right to be upset, nervous, or mad about that. That would make sense for anyone in this situation. What can we do to think differently about it or respond differently? Thank you, Annie. Um, let's see. Marcia uh, or Marcia. People assume that ADHD is acting wild, always hyper, and that's not the case. I agree. People assume that if you have ADHD, you're hyper all the time, and they don't understand in a ton of ADHD. Um, uh, so that can be very challenging. Um, I'm just writing that down. So what about the fact that ADHD is overdiagnosed? Does anyone ever say to you, I think ADHD is overdiagnosed and you probably don't have it? Anybody? Um, also, one thing that I think is really hard is that a lot of people think ADHD is, you know, kind of travels by itself. And ADHD actually always has friends around. And those friends might be uh, learning disabilities, those friends might be anxiety, depression, um, level one autism, uh, you know, those, those things might be um, different kinds of you know, not just reading, writing, and math learning disabilities, but some other types, other kinds of physical challenges. So the point is that ADHD rarely travels alone. And so people think that it's, you know, they want to find out, well, if this is your ADHD, what's the ADHD and what's the other thing, you know, whether it's ODD or something. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, sometimes things get mixed up. You know, it's not always cut and dry, right? Zoe says, for me, I didn't use help in my late teens and 20s because people tried to help me their way. Yes, Zoe, that's fantastic. Um, and they didn't listen to me about what I was actually struggling with. Or they didn't listen to your systems in your brain and try to help your self systems of organization or productivity um, be more effective. And that's really important. We want to work with what makes sense to you or your kids. Um, Okay, lots of responses. Gretchen, I felt that way when my daughter was diagnosed, barely any help from school. So, you know, I don't know what it's like in, in other countries, but I know here in the United States, um, uh, you know, kids are entitled to support. They're entitled to a 504 plan or an IEP if they have um, a coexisting um, learning disability or something else. So I think it's important to find out what sort of services are available and your child is mandated for. Um, Jenny says, oh, they say, oh, don't we all have ADHD nowadays because of computers or something? Okay, so let's just end that right now. You know, I, what really gets me is when I say like, oh, I, you know, I, I work with people living with ADHD and they say, like, doesn't everyone have a little ADHD? Like, you know, no, because everyone has executive functioning skills and everyone may, chat, may, may struggle with some of their executive functioning skills. And yes, people multitask all the time, which affects their ability to focus and concentrate. But that doesn't mean you have ADHD. You know, people who have ADHD have persistent challenges, persistent um, issues with, with, um, with hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattention, focus, concentration, and a whole bunch of other stuff that are actually, you know, seriously impacting their lives, right? It, so, no, we don't all have a little ADHD. May, might we all be a little, like, over-focused over on our phones and distracted? Absolutely. 
older folks think it's not a thing. I've heard it multiple times, but I've never heard it said to me directly. Well, that's good, Kaylee. Cassandra, it was in the past, but they have strength, since strengthened the diagnosis criteria. Right. And that's important to remember. The diagnosis, which was given out much more freely 20 years ago, is actually much more rigid now. The, 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 the requirements are more rigid, and I think people are more, um, more cautious about you know, making sure that kids and adults are meeting the criteria. There are, the problem is that there have been a lot of articles written that dismiss it altogether or say it's a big pharma conspiracy. I've tried so hard to give people solid information and prove that it's a real disorder that negatively affects people in all of the important aspects of life. Good for you, Cassandra, and it is an uphill battle. That's why we're all so grateful to Attitude. Yay! And this month, of course, is ADHD Awareness Month, which is why we're having this conversation right now, because I would like you this month to, to take pride in the different brain you have in whatever strengths and challenges you have, but to take pride in, in you being you because you bring your unique talents to this world. And I know as someone who's here every Friday with you all, how wonderful that is. I feel blessed always to engage with you. The reason why more children, young people and adults are being diagnosed is because it's more recognized. That's exactly right, Amanda. Um, Dale, uh, that was me, didn't get diagnosed to a 58, wow. Susan, ADHD, that's the hyper little boy thing, right? Wrong. Well, it is right for some cases, but not for many. And particularly boys who have inattentive ADHD are often overlooked completely because they don't fit the model of hyperactive boys and because they're not, you know, sort of, they don't sort of fit the model of ADHD in girls, so they're just overlooked. And that can be very problematic. Kaylee, since I, I've been diagnosed since I was eight, and yet it wasn't until I got to college that I was informed that I was able to get accommodations in school. Ugh. That's one thing that I think is really terrible and important, that um, until the age of 18 here in the United States, you, um, schools are mandated under IDEA to provide services. After the age of eight, 18, excuse me, when you go to college or a vocational school, you, your, your services are now covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, and I have a client who was talking to the um, accommodations office at her, at her college this week, the officer, and the officer was like, well, you know, this doesn't really sound like it. I'm not sure I can give you an accommodation for that. And so finally, my client's like, I'm overwhelmed all the time. I struggle to plan and prioritize and organize and get things done. I need the accommodation. And then the woman was like, oh, you're overwhelmed? Well, we can give you an accommodation then. It was, it was so stressful for this person and unnecessarily so. In Texas, I have found you have to fight for accommodations in schools and follow up to ensure they are followed. Yes, Liza, I've heard that as well. ADHD can look like laziness too. It can, but it's not about laziness. It's about not having enough dopamine to push yourself to do something that seems uninteresting or un unpleasant. Um, Angie, a little ADD. Ha, yeah, that's not ADHD, bro. That's called distracted. Amen, Angie. I'm now facing the very narrow limitations on the accommodations that can be made in my university. Right. And so you're, you need to really access the Office of Student Disabilities because you have ADHD, you have a diagnosis, and you should have accommodations. And that can, um, sounds like you're not getting treated. So uh, I, I hope you have an advisor who can advocate for you. And if not, I would encourage going outside of the system and bringing somebody in to help you. Ah, this is interesting. Meds are just legalized meth. Wow, I have not heard of that. That's interesting. Okay, well, we know that that's wrong. And um, I, um, I'm sorry people think that, but um, methamphetamines and a stimulant are very different. Um, Marsha, he doesn't look like he has ADHD. Oh my gosh, that is just the worst. I've heard that too. Well, it doesn't look like he has ADHD. He seems to be really smart and he's doing okay in some subjects. Of course, he's okay in the subjects that interest him or that are easy for him and he's struggling in the ones that aren't. Dale, I'm not broken, I'm special. You bet. 
Angie, yeah, I get extended test time. That's it. It's better than nothing. Um, my client just got um, extended time on her papers. So she gets a little bit extra time uh, on, her, on, on her papers and, um, and gets extended test time. Jess, hi. Uh, my two sons, eight and 13, were both diagnosed with ADHD this summer. My oldest was diagnosed because he was inattentive. We are homeschooling this year and are working hard to understand the way each child learns. In addition to breaking lessons or information into smaller chunks, offering a lot of breaks and asking for their input about how they enjoy learning and providing lots of outdoor time, do you have suggestions for resources that we as parents can learn and use to help our, our children learn? Yes, that's a good question. And um, uh, Annie, if you can put some resources up, that would be great. Um, Attitude does have resources for home homeschool homeschoolers. Um, I think that the things that you're implementing uh, already make sense. Uh, we might want to consider um, uh, basically deciding like which subjects are easy for them and which subjects are medium and which subjects are hard, and then talk with them about the order in which they'd like to approach their studies because they might want to do the easy thing first and get in a role and then do the hard thing, or they may want to do the hard thing in the morning when their brain is the freshest. So that would be useful. Claire, I was diagnosed with ADHD at 40 after years of being treated for depression and an eventual breakdown. I'm so glad you got diagnosed and I hope you're doing better. Robert, I wish you could be on mainstream media. <laughs> Thank you so much. Invite me and I'll come. You'd be such a great advocate for us. It's ADHD Awareness Month and I haven't seen a single, single thing on British television. I live in Scotland. There is such a lack of awareness. Man, I am so sorry to hear that, Robert, and set it up and I'll come. Um, Carol, um, I you also, Robert, you might want to look at, into Addis, A-D-D-I-S-S. -S. It's run by um, my friend Andrea uh, Bilbao, and it's fantastic, and it's a great organization based in London. Um, Yeah, you can get that too, but it doesn't come close to the challenge you experience. So um, I think the more the more support that you can have to articulate that challenge and then trying to get somebody outside of the college to to make them give you the accommodations could be useful, particularly someone from a, the disabilities world. Does menopause have a big thing to do with ADHD symptoms to reappear? Yes. In fact, I once went to this conference with... Um, Russell Barkley many years ago, and he said any woman who's in perimenopause, you know, it's basically like having going through a, a, a mini ADHD uh, period. Gretchen, I asked for 504 IEP accommodation evaluation, and the school wanted to start with a school support uh, system, which was a few staff had a meeting. Okay, well that didn't work, so go back and ask for more. Also, if you live in the United States, you might want to get an advocate. Um, it's highly worth the money, um, or if you, have a, if you have a therapist who's working with you or a coach, anybody you can bring to a meeting to advocate and, and, and tell um, the educators what they should be doing is very useful. The office is the problem. I see. Is there an office, Carol, in your town or a greater office above the one at the school that you could uh, advocate? Um, John, diagnosed since age eight, spent most of my life in ADHD, ADH denial due to internalized ableism. Mm. Turning 40 next month and finally able to, uh, starting to understand. I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, I think all of us, everybody has internalized um, ableism or prejudices that we deal with. Mom acted ADHD forever and then hit menopause and got diagnosed bipolar makes me worry. Well, um, sometimes, you know, ADHD and bipolar often travel in the same spectrum and um, she may or may, you know, she may have, she may be bipolar or she may just have very serious ADHD. And if you're being treated for your ADHD, Take a deep breath, it's a different time, and hopefully it'll be a different outcome for you. Cassandra, all parents with ADHD should bookmark this amazing letter. It covers all of the law that tells you your child what your child is entitled to. That is fantastic. I'm gonna copy that, and I'm gonna put it um, 
make sure that uh, we that everybody gets a copy of that. Uh, I also want to share with you that um, I have a downloadable uh, about shame and how you can overcome being embarrassed about who you are that I think is a perfect thing for this kickoff for ADHD Awareness Month. So I'm just going to send that, post that downloadable for you. Mar Marcia, my son was, or Marcia, my son was diagnosed four years ago at age eight. I'm 45 and see so much of myself in him. You know, you know, again, you may share characteristics. You yourself may have ADHD, but I think it's important to, um, you know, to sh whether or not you have the label or if you share the executive functioning skill, skill challenges or you have executive functioning skill challenges, which of course you must if you're a human being, then you can work together in a parallel process with your kids and say, well, I'm going to work on this issue or you can work on this issue, what it, you know, or that he, that he chooses, or you can each choose something for the other person, you know, as uh, uh, it, you can go either way about it. Angie, I have psychiatrists throw out my previous ADHD diagnosis and try to label the problem as other things without a full or proper assessment. I wonder if this is part of the issue. Yes, Carol, that's a very good point. You know, perhaps your mother was not assessed for ADHD, had a psychological evaluation, um, a neuropsych or something, that would be helpful. So a problem I had with extended time for dyslexia it doesn't really accommodate for getting bored and walking out. The extra time for ADHD needs to be, a neat, for ADHD possibly needs to include movement breaks, agreed. Say, I was diagnosed as a mature adult with ADHD and it answered a lot of my questions. Why do I do the things I do? I wish there was more information out there to the school system. Teachers should have it in their education at university. I did done lots of research to help me, but not everyone is willing to do that. That's true. Thank you, Annie, for that article. Thank you for the link to Addis. Uh, Tracy, my daughter has accommodations, but the school keeps saying, but the teachers already do this for all students. No, mm -mm. no. Whether the teachers do that for all students or not, if your daughter is still struggling in the classroom, then the accommodations are not sufficient. And I think one of the things that's really important is I think sometimes I feel like, you know, there are a lot of schools are tired of dealing with parents of kids with ADHD. And so they're like, yeah, we do this already. No, you have rights. Make sure you find out what your rights are. And thank you so much for the person who posted that um, link. Angie, she got severely depressed. Bipolar makes sense, but it makes me wonder. Marcia, uh, rejection sensitivity, is that what it's called? I'm not sure what the question is. Um, yes, it is. It's called rejection sensitivity dysphoria, RSD. Um, that is so true. Robert, I'm in England and people do not have any awareness or understanding. My son is just going through neurodevelopmental assessment and it looks like he has ADHD too. Yeah, so I would really check out Addis. Um, I think they do an incredible job and Andrea is a wonderful person. Um, Angie, I've lived in China. The psych told me that I don't seem to have it, only my kids do. I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, let's see. Um, my son has ADHD, ASD, and ODD. ODD is horrific. So ODD can be treated with when it comes along with ADHD and ASD. And actually research has shown that if kids who are on uh, the autism spectrum but don't meet the full criteria for ADHD or those who do meet the full criteria, that taking medications for ADHD can reduce the symptoms of ASD and it can also reduce the symptoms of ODD. Uh, and along with um, family therapy or parental education or instruction, ODD uh, in this way can Im improve within two years. Cassandra, I've been diagnosed for years and I still struggle to get some of my family to understand my limitations as they relate to ADHD. I actually just said that if my disability were physical and visible, people would be more understanding. Yes, I think that's totally true. Um, ODD is very difficult to deal with. 
Uh, my son is being investigated for this. Thank you, Claire. So I think that ODD is also like it has to do with in, um, impulse, um, poor impulse control and emotional dysregulation, but it's also a relationship problem. Some of the ways in which people are responding to your son, including you, maybe, um, maybe uh, you know, heightening um, the response instead of lowering the response. And that's why family therapy or parent or family education or parent education uh, is so useful for treating ODD. Thank you, Annie, for that resource. Um, Annabelle, I didn't struggle academically, but the anxiety I had was horrific. Yes, yeah, so anxiety is a very good friend of ADHD. It travels around. Um, and uh, we have talked about that before, and maybe we'll do that again this year. Uh, Annabelle, RSD is the worst part of ADHD. I see this in so many kids. Yes, right. And so part of that rejection sensitivity comes from feeling like they, they don't measure up. You know, it's that shame, which is why I share that with you. Tracy, from first to third grade, I begged the public school, I begged the public school to help me get the, uh, the process to get a diagnosis or help. They did not tell me that I needed a private assessment. I finally got one when my son was nine. By that time, I moved him to a private school that really worked for him. I never received an IEP because he was doing well. The school closed last year. Ugh. He's in online school. I asked for current accommodations. Are private schools mandated to do IEPs? What's the best way to get accommodations now or later in university? So private schools are not mandated um, to follow the IEP, but they are held accountable in some way. And you absolutely want to make sure that before your son goes to university that he has another set around of testing um, so that the, um, the report is there and that you can ask for accommodations at the university. We have so many comments. I'm not sure I'm going to get to them because it's now 4.50. I'll take a couple more and then um, we'll come back to this topic, obviously. Um, I like the idea of working alongside your kids as you work on your issues. My daughter and I struggle with impulse, especially when the two of us are in conflict with each other. Mm, here on that one. Any suggestions of how we can both work together on our impulse control? You know, I talk about this in my book, but you want to use stop, think, act. So you want to call, call a pause in the action for 10 to 15 minutes until your system can calm down, then get together. And I would use reflective listening. You ask her what she thinks is going on. She tells you and you say, what I heard you say is this. Did I get that right? Is there anything else? And you do that for 10 minutes or five minutes and then you switch. And then you say, what are we going to do to move forward? Okay. Um, Marcia, my son is ADHD and 11. He comes home often upset because of how other kids treat him. Um, one instance, friend was calling him inappropriate names. I've tried to get an adult at school. When scenarios like this, he refuses to tell anyone, so it's not a tattletale. Um, yeah, I would go into school and have a meeting with your son and some caring adult in the school where he, with whom he feels safe and, and create a couple safety plans. He doesn't have to tell on anyone, but he needs to have a, a, some outs, some escape plans. Um, and I'll take one more question. Um, let's see. I love how you all can communicate with each other. It's so fantastic. Um, I wish I had more support, Annabelle says, from the ADHD community, but most people struggle with me as I don't medicate and don't want to, and they probably have some judgment about that. Not everybody can take medication, and I think the thing that you want to say is that, you know, pills don't teach skills. I am working on learning the skills I need to live effectively and with satisfaction as an adult with ADHD and to help my kids with ADHD do the same. Thank you, everybody, so much. Wow, um, what a great session this has been. I really appreciate it. Um, Annabelle, I encourage you to keep coming here to get the support you need. And um, 